highest honor an English town can confer, the freedom of a borough, is bestowed in Aldershot on the Canadian Army overseas. Through the area known to every Canadian soldier of two wars, with General Montague presiding, a representative force marches to the Aldershot football field for the ceremony. While the picked guard of honor stands solidly by, His Worship the Mayor presents a token silver casket and script, which is accepted by the retiring Canadian Chief of Staff. It will be replaced at a later date by a scroll and album sent for permanent placing in Dominion archives. Four platoons from the 2nd Canadian Special Infantry Battalion give an exhibition of drill rivaling the precision of a Guards Regiment on parade. The town which has seen the arrival and the departure on every grand venture of Canadian units since 1939 thus tangibly expresses the friendship existing between the mother country and the Dominion with the freedom of Aldershot. To London's Denham Film Studios comes a group of Canadian repats to see how big time movies are made in Great Britain's Hollywood. On soundstage five, a feature picture is in the making. Produced by the famous team of Powell and Pressburger, it is titled, A Matter of Life and Death. On a giant moving staircase set costing 36,000 pounds, the scene portrays a dying airman's idea of a court of justice in the other world. The famous Canadian actor, Raymond Massey, greets his fellow countrymen. Mr. Massey is the brother of Canada's High Commissioner to Britain. Michael Powell, the co-producer of the picture, plays host. Powell knows Canada too. He directed the picture 49th Parallel in the Dominion a few years ago. The Canadian Army newsreel cameraman shooting this story worked with him on that picture. Ray Massey explains all the 101 details which go on backstage during the making of an opus in glorious Technicolor. Hollywood lease land actress Kim Hunter and David Niven receive makeup checks. While Raymond Massey and the other stars of the picture, Roger Livesey and Marius Goring, stand by for a take. With all the preliminary rehearsing completed, the call comes, quiet everyone, we're shooting. Cameraman, action. The great color camera gets rolling and another scene is recorded ready for the world's theater. After the take, the stars demonstrate their technique to their guests. David Niven gives an off-stage performance which makes a certain CWAC long remember her visit to Denham Studios. In London, the Thanksgiving week savings drive is opened by an air demonstration by Battle of Britain pilots. Group Captain Doug Bader, the legless ace, leads the dwindled ranks of the famous few as augmented by their comrades with wings They give a great demonstration of empire aerial might over the city they saved from annihilation. Just five years ago, the veterans brought down 185 German planes in one day and thus changed the course of history. Now they fly over a peaceful city whose people remember by saving to win the peace as they won the war. In Trafalgar Square, an exhibition of the diabolical machines of destruction which fell on London gives point to the exhortation, save for reconstruction. Canucks are reminded of the approach of their own great savings drive. On the eve of Canada's ninth victory loan, wise Canadians are ready to put their surplus cash into victory bonds. They too will help win the peace as they keep on saving. It's moving time for the second Canadian division in Holland. With the repatriation schedule running at full blast, the Blue Patch boys are homeward bound. Breaking camp for the last time is a pleasant fatigue. Even blankoing the webbing is fun when you've got plenty of help and when the order is to smarten up for points west. The Toronto Scottish Regiment lower the flag carried by them so proudly from Normandy beaches to victory. They leave together with the 14th Field Company RCE and the 2nd Field Battery RCA. On their way through Nijmegen repat camp, they cross Folks Bridge at Arnhem and finally arrive at the embarkation point. The boat fare is strictly on the government, and if there's no shoving in the queues, it's not because the boys are not in a hurry to get to Blighty. (laughs) 
how can a man sleep when the white cliffs of Dover mark the beginning of the end of the trip, which will bring the fighting second back to the land of the maple? The Cocky University for Canadian Army personnel at Leavesden, Hertfordshire, is officially opened by Field Marshal Sir Bernard Montgomery. A modern college has sprung up on the premises of what was number 23 Canadian General Hospital. Nearly 600 students and 60 faculty members hear the announcement which proclaims the institute officially open. Following his address, the field marshal, together with the university president, Brigadier Beamont OBE, inspect the premises. On registering, the men and women students are issued with tunics carrying the university flash. For the faculty and student body, there are no parades, no saluting, and no difference of rank. The college is made up of five houses, each named after a former Governor General of Canada. At the end of each course, the University of London conducts examinations. Credits gained from these exams are acceptable to any Canadian university. Culminating the plans of the Canadian Army educational staffs, the Institute is successfully reconverting training for war to the now important task of training for peace. Army students in the overseas theatres are now able to put their further overseas stay to vital educational use thanks to the Cocky University of Canada. At Victoria Park grounds in Canada's Rodeo capital, the 60th edition of the famous Calgary Exhibition and Stampede gets off to a flying start with a wild cow milking race. The big bad sister of Elsie the Contented Cow gives with the gallons whether she likes it or not. Elsie's young brother gets a workout in the calf roping contest. The beefsteaks of the future take a dim view of the operation, but working to split seconds, the cowboys give them lots of rope and, well, what can a fella do when he's flat on his back? It's all very well picking on a guy half your size, but the crowd in the bleachers get their money's worth when the steer decorating contest begins. The general idea of this parlor game is to tie the pretty red ribbons on Bossy's horns and, brother, that ain't easy. When it comes to riding the bucking horses, maybe Gene Autry could handle the situation while rolling a cigarette with one hand, playing a guitar with the other, and singing Home on the Range at the same time. But he sure would have to have plenty of glue on his pants. The trouble with these fellas is they just won't listen to reason. the folks in the cheap seats are getting bored, the next item on the program is the steer riding game. The mobile ads for Bovril are all guaranteed man killers or your money refunded. The riders have been turned down by every insurance company in the West. In their idea of fun, you don't live to a ripe old age. Round out the performance, the chuck wagon race gets underway. When it comes to taking the grub from point A to point B, the demon drivers have even the Army Service Corps beaten on points. As they battle it out hub to hub, there are no holes barred. Alvin Hinkler of Red Willow, Alberta, draws ahead in a driving finish. He breaks the world's record for chuck wagon driving in the grand spectacle of the West, the Calgary Stampede. 